Okay, so in this lecture, we're finally ready to actually deploy our contract. So I'm going to walk you through uh, what that looks like. So we're going to do the contract that we had before uh, in the previous lecture, the simple storage contract, where um, you have to pay in order to change this integer that's that's on the Ethereum network. Uh, we're going to deploy it on uh, something called RinkB, which is a test net for Ethereum. Uh, so it runs almost the same as real Ethereum. Um, but it doesn't use real money. Uh, so, so it uses this sort of um, pretend money, uh, which behaves the same as actual Ether. Uh, you can transact it uh, in exactly the same way. Uh, the only point is that you can get it for free. Uh, so if you sign up, you can get uh, a couple Ether, testnet Ether, and uh, you can't take this over to the main net of Ethereum and uh, spend it there. Okay, uh, now th there are some differences in how this blockchain operates compared to mainnet. Uh, in particular, when the project wants to experiment uh, with new sort of efficiency gains or other things, they tend to do it on testnet first, because if they break testnet, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Um, and there have been a couple of different testnets over time that, that have played around with different technologies. Um, so anyways, it's, it's sort of a sandbox for you to test your applications out and also for the Ethereum project to test out different improvements to the protocol. All right, so this is um, the Ethereum client. Uh, so this is the official client uh, from the Ethereum project or the Ethereum foundation. And there's lots of different uh, clients that you might use. Uh, you don't have to use this client. Uh, Ethereum, at the end of the day, is really a protocol. And so different people will write different clients uh, to uh, that, that that are compatible with the with that protocol. But anyways, this is the official client. It's still pretty nice. We can do everything that we want to do uh, within it. Um, so let me just walk you through a few things. So here we have uh, an overview of our accounts. Uh, so these are all the accounts uh, that, that you might have in your client. Uh, I've already set up one account, uh, which is called main. And it currently holds three Ether, which is testnet Ether. Uh, this is the address of that account. And, um, and so, so, so anyways, uh, then there's a, a place for, for deploying contracts. Uh, and so, so contracts actually come in two flavors. There's uh, what are called wallet contracts. And then up here you have sort of generic contracts. So simple storage is a contract so that we're going to deploy it. Um, the point of having a wallet contract, actually, let's go back to the account. So these main accounts, they don't do anything. They have no functionality. It's just like a sort of like a Bitcoin account. Uh, it can hold Ether. It can transact Ether. You can send it from this account to another account. But let's say that you receive, uh, let's say I receive Ether into this account. Uh, there's no logging of any of the information about you know who sent it to me all this stuff is recorded on the blockchain but but the point is that i would have to go to the blockchain to figure out let's say that i got paid twice in the same block then my balance would go up uh, by the sum of those two payments but going in and figuring out what those two payments were where did they come from that type of thing uh it, it's a little challenging you basically have to to, to go into the blockchain and, and look for it um so what the uh what the Ethereum people suggest is that you actually create a little contract, uh, just you know something that you could think of as being coded up in Solidity, uh, that will function like a main account because contracts can hold Ether. Uh, it will it will hold your Ether for you uh, like an account. It will have you know a, the ability to transfer money and things like that. Uh, but because you have broader functionality, you have the functionality of an actual contract. You can make it do fancier things like it could log uh, different events. Uh, for transactions, um, you can have in, for for a main account. Uh, so this address is the hash of a public key. There's one private key that can sign over this account. Uh, but in a wallet contract, you could set it up where maybe two out of three people uh, need to sign uh, for different information, or you can impose different access structures. Um, now you're free to write your own wallet contract. Uh, but anyways, the main client comes with a, a sort of pre-baked uh, wallet contract that adds some functionality, okay? Um, so this is what we're going to do. What we're going to do is I'm going to take this main account, which has three Ether. I'm going to set up two uh, wallet contracts, uh, one for we'll call Alice and one for Bob. And uh, I'll show you how that works. And then what we'll do is we'll move uh, one Ether into these two new wallet contracts. And 
then we'll we'll set up our, our actual simple storage. Uh, we'll make Alice the owner, and then I'll show you what happens when Bob tries to access it. And um, we'll go through a couple of the different uh, cases inside that code itself. Okay. Um, so let's start by, we'll create a wallet contract. Uh, this is like some phantom wallet thing that I, I set up a long time ago that never went through. I don't, I don't know how to get rid of it. If anyone knows how to get rid of it, you can leave a comment uh, on YouTube. Um, but anyways, uh, so I'm gonna click um, uh, a new wallet contract. Now, every contract comes from an address. So an address launches the contract, it runs the constructor, and so they're considered the owner. Well, the contract itself, it's up to the contract if they want to track the owner. So we know from simple storage that we want to track who the owner was. And these wallet contracts are like that as well. So uh, this main account, I'm going to make the owner of this wallet. Uh, I'll call the wallet Alice. Um, so Alice and Bob will still have the same owner. So technically, they're not separate people, but uh, we're, we're just setting up a little test environment. So we'll, we'll pretend Alice and Bob are separate people with separate owners, even though they have a common owner, okay? Uh, it gives you some options. Uh, so I'm gonna set it up as a single owner account. So that means that this, uh, this account, uh, the key that's associated with this account is going to ask Ethereum to run the constructor for a new wallet contract. This name, I think is just for the user interface. I don't think that actually gets put into the contract at all. I could be wrong on that. Um, but anyways, let's let's see what happens. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create uh, the contract. You can see that I'm not putting any ether into the contract itself. Uh, all I'm doing is uh, I'm just running the constructor on it, and I'm going to have to pay gas for it. Okay, so when I run this locally and I run uh, the create contract on my computer and I count up all the, the EVM operations that it would take to actually create this contract. Uh, this is the amount of gas that my computer consumes. Okay, so I'm going to assume that uh, when I push this out on the Ethereum network, it's probably going to take the same amount of gas, but th there could be a variety of reasons that we've talked about that it might take a little less or a little more. I assume this is a pretty deterministic contract. It doesn't involve anybody else. Uh, so it's probably going to consume exactly this amount of gas, but we're never really sure. And so what they do is they, uh, what the user interface says is, uh, why don't you stake a little more gas just in case it ends up taking a little longer, uh, then you won't run out of gas when you try and deploy it. At the same time, maybe there's something really wrong with this contract and it ends up eating up all of your ether. And so you want to put a kind of upper bound on it. So right now, uh, the upper bound that my client is suggesting to me is uh, 0 0.003. This is almost 0 0.002, uh, it's one nine. Um, so, so there's an extra a thousandth of an ether uh, that, that I'm, I'm putting here that, that might get consumed, we're not sure. And uh, of this, uh, the amount of ether that will actually go to the miner will be the exact amount it takes to run. Okay, so this is a maximum fee that you might pay, but in reality, you're going to end up paying a little less than this. Okay, and then um, uh, we also have to say how much uh, we want to pledge in, uh, how much ether are we going to say for gas? And so our client fills this in for us. Uh, so they, they sort of know. Uh, kind of what, what people are paying on average and things like that. And uh, you could change this if you wanted to, but anyways, we're going to just use the, the client default of this. This is all pretend money, it's on testnet anyways. Um, so this should all work, okay? Now, the EVM code of the actual contract, the wallet contract that's baked into the client, you can see it here, it doesn't, doesn't let you scroll through it, but um, you could see that, okay? And then the final thing is because we're launching it from this address, this address has to sign the creation of the contract. Uh, and this address has a private key. The private key happens to be stored on my computer because this account is, is on my computer. So there's a file somewhere, uh, but that file is wrapped in a password. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type a password in here. It's gonna unlock the private key that's associated with this main account and then it's going to use it to sign the request to create this contract, broadcast it to the Ethereum network, and then we'll pick it up from there. Okay, so I'll put in my password. And, uh, okay, so, so that's done now. Okay, so now what we're going to do is uh, we can go down to the latest transactions. And 
uh, we'll wait for it to show up. So what happens is it broadcasts it first uh, to the network itself, okay? And then we're waiting for a new block to be created. So there was just a new block that was created. Uh, I still haven't seen uh, the, the transaction yet. So it might be that it wasn't included in that block. We might have to wait another block. Uh, blocks come, um, they come once uh, every 15 seconds or so. Uh, so you can see that there, there's a couple blocks being added. Um, now you can see that we have some action here. And so our transaction was included in a block. And now what we're waiting for is we're adding, we're waiting for a couple of blocks to be added onto the end of the block uh, that created uh, this contract. Okay. Now, if we want to see what's going on in terms of the, the blockchain network itself, uh, we can go over to, uh, for example, Etherscan, uh, which is uh, a, a scanner for all the transactions that happen on Ethereum. Uh, it, it also works for the test net. So we're on this particular test net. And so I'm going to wait for my user interface to show me a little bit more information about what block that contract ended up in. And then we're going to try and find it. We'll try and find it uh, in the, the actual blockchain itself. But uh, you can see that uh, in the last 12 seconds ago, 27 seconds ago, 42 seconds ago, 57 seconds ago, you can see that uh, different blocks have been added onto it. Uh, I imagine that we're in one of these blocks. Because this is testnet, it's very low volume. You know, so in Bitcoin, blocks come every 10 minutes and there's you know, tens of thousands of transactions in it. Here we have like 10, 14, 15 transactions. So there's not a lot of transactions in every single block. Uh, we, can, we can maybe find our transactions if we, if we take a look while we wait. So something like this might be our transaction. Uh, I, I have to go back and remember what the key was that it launched from. So we have B803. Let's just see if, if we can find our transaction. Otherwise, our client will eventually show it to us. Um, so what I'm expecting is I'm expecting to see a transaction called contract creation that came from B8036. So here it is actually right here. Okay, so this uh, was the transaction uh, that uh, that, that we sent. Okay, so you can see that uh, this is the hash of the transaction itself. Uh, you can see that it was in this block number. Uh, you can see the address that it came from. So B803, uh, you can see that that's our address, B803. Um, with high probability, I didn't check all the, all the digits of that. Um, you can see that it created a new contract. We didn't send any ether with it. Uh, I said, uh, I would spend up to 3 million uh, gas. Uh, it mined it in 1.9 million gas. So that was, uh, that was actually, I think, the, the exact amount that my client predicted it would take. So it ended up taking exactly that amount. It was 65% of the amount of gas that I pledged. Uh, this is how much uh, I, I offered in Ether for every unit of gas. Um, and uh, this was the, the actual contract itself, which is just byte code. Um, so it's, it's sort of hard to see uh, what it looks like. Uh, you, you can't really make sense of it. And um, now the contract that we created, it's given its own address, okay? So the wallet contract is sitting at this particular address. Uh, and so um, that, that's the address of, of, of the wallet itself. Uh, let's see what else we have. Uh, so here, uh, Ethereum is smart enough uh, because this is a very standard contract that people push. I mean, it comes right from the main client itself. Uh, they they know exactly. They can look at the bytecode and say, "Oh, you you just did a wallet." Um, so they'll they'll show us the source code uh, for the wallet itself. Um, yeah. What else can I say? So so here you can see the contract starts at four one eight eight. And here now it's completed, so it's fully confirmed, meaning enough blocks have been added onto the end of it that we're very confident that it won't disappear. And so you can see 401A8 uh, is the address that it exists at, okay? Uh, this is the owner of it. And um, anyway, there's, there's no money in this account yet, okay? So what we're gonna do now is, I'm gonna create a second one for a second person, we'll call it Bob. I'll do this a little quicker.
and then we'll have uh, two different uh, contracts, okay? Now, while we're waiting for Bob to be created, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send some of this ether to Alice. Uh, so I, we have three here, so I'm gonna give one to Alice, one to Bob eventually when he's created, uh, and then keep one in the main account. So if I want to transfer Ether, this is just what it looks like uh, in the main Ethereum. Uh, con so this looks very similar to Bitcoin. Uh, so I have the account that it's coming from, which I'll call main account. I'm going to send it to uh, Alice's wallet contract. So I have to get her address. So I'm going to grab it here. I'm going to copy it. There's a warning about how uh, addresses are the same whether you're on testnet or mainnet. And so it's it's easy to think that you created something on the mainnet because you created it on testnet. And so there's there's a couple errors that you might make in terms of moving money uh, from a contract that's only on testnet thinking it's on real net. And so, so never do that. Um, okay, so we're gonna send it from Ether, or sorry, from Alice uh, to this account. Uh, the amount we wanna send is one Ether. Uh, here they're gonna give me some options about uh, what the fee is that I wanna pay. Uh, so if I increase the fee, uh, they, they expect that it will run a little faster. I can try and do it with a very, very low fee or even no fee, and maybe it will eventually get mined. Um, it's up to the miners. Because this is testnet, it's not, you know, everything tends to get, uh, tends to get mined. Okay. Um, so anyways, I, I'm just going to leave it at the default setting. Um, there's a few more options here if you want to pass some data along with your transaction. Uh, then the receiving address might log that data. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later um, when we talk about re-entry attacks. But um, anyways, I'm, I'm ready to send this, so I'm going to go ahead and send this. And um, whoops, I messed this up. Okay, so I want to send it from main account, sorry, to, to the wallet here. Okay, so this is currently being sent. So let's go back to our main interface. Uh, we can see that Bob's in the process of being created and that transaction that we sent is, is still hasn't been sent yet. So we'll, we'll wait for that uh, to go through. Uh, once Bob's created, then I'll, I'll send money to Bob as well. Okay, so I'm back. Uh, I realized that I actually the user interface was was sort of, it's a little buggy on Apple when you have it full screen. And so there was a, a confirmation screen that I wasn't seeing. So the transaction, the transfers actually didn't go through. Uh, so I'm going to redo it. Uh, I'll sh you'll see what, what went wrong. Um, okay, so Alice and Bob were created. Uh, the only thing that didn't happen is we didn't move one Ether from the main account to Alice's account or to Bob's account. So let's redo that step. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab Alice's address. Uh, then I'm going to go up to send. I'm going to pick uh, the main account. I'm going to send it to Alice's account. Uh, the amount I want to send is one Ether. Uh, I'll just make it go as fast as possible. And I'll click send. And uh, it was at this point that I just abandoned it. But really what happens is there's another screen that pops up where I have to type my password in, set the gas, and all that type of stuff. Um, so here it is here. All right, so uh, this is saying you want to transfer one ether from this to this account. Uh, this is how much gas uh, we think it's going to take. Uh, so because this is a simple transfer, um, it will actually take exactly this amount of gas. Uh, the amount of fee uh, that we can provide is, once again, our, our client just fills in something by default, so I'm just going to leave it and I'll leave the gas price as well. So I'm going to type my password in to confirm this transaction. So now it's actually sent. Uh, and I'm going to do the same thing for Bob. So let me go back. I'll grab Bob's key value. I'll copy it. And uh, you can see the transaction went through for Alice. So she now has one Ether. Uh, we have two Ether left in our main account. We actually have slightly less than two because we paid some fees in order to create these two wallet contracts. Um, but anyways, uh, so I'll send it from main account to uh, Bob's account. I'm going to send one Ether. I'll just pay the maximum fee. It's pretend money anyways. And we'll 
just wait for the, the other screen to show up. go looking for the screen here it is okay uh, so that transfer is done uh, if anyone is watching this from the ethereum project probably not watching this because it's very basic tutorial but anyways it, it would be great if you could fix your uh, your your full screen behavior on Apple uh, because that tends to be a little buggy Okay, so we have Alice, we have Bob, uh, we have these two wallets. One other thing I'll show you is, um, this is the main account. So you can see this is the exact amount of ether that's left. Uh, this is the address of the main account. And so uh, we, we only did a few things with it. We launched two wallet contracts from it, and then we launched two transactions of one ether each. So if we go over to a website like this, which is a, a block explorer for, um, for, for uh, the testnet, uh, and I just type my address in here, you can see that uh, this is all the records of the transactions involving this address. So five days ago, I received three ether at it from uh, a, a, what's called a faucet service, uh, which, which gives you free testnet ether uh, if you sign up with some social media account. Um, then you can see that we created our two wallet contracts. Uh, so it was about 15 minutes ago because I paused the video. And then uh, less than a minute ago, we sent one ether to this address and we sent another ether uh, to this address. Okay, so that's, that's the set of transactions. Okay, so this is, so far we've seen how Ethereum works uh, when it kind of emulates the basic, um, the same uh, basic functionality as Bitcoin itself. Okay, so this is how Ethereum works when it, it's sort of behaving like uh, like a cryptocurrency itself. Now what we want to do is we want to actually push our smart contract, uh, the one that we wrote in the last class, and we want to push it uh, to the actual Ethereum network.